states of matter and solutions in a nutshell. So we're going to talk about uh, the three different states that you're going to have to deal with, which is solid, liquid, and gas, and also solutions, which are basically when you're dissolving a solid inside of a liquid and it's dissociating like an ionic compound. Or in the case of a molecular compound like sugar, it's dissolving, but it's not necessarily dissociating. Dissociating referring to whether it breaks into ions or not. So when something breaks to ions, we say it dissociates. When something just goes on like sugar and doesn't break apart to individual components, it's basically sugar molecules, we call that dissolving. So let's get started, and we're going to start, start talking about gases first, because that's one of the more important topics. So the things you need to understand about gases and the characteristics of it is that, unlike liquids, they do the following. They expand to fill their container. Um, gases typically have an infinite, not infinite, it has a large amount of space between one another. That's because they're not supposed to attract or repel each other according to kinetic molecular theory, which we'll talk about a little later. But whatever container you put it in, they'll take the size of that container. If you want to put it in the scuba tank, it'll take the size of the scuba tank. If you want to put it into a larger volume, it'll expand to fill that container. So it takes up all the space in there. They're highly compressible, and that's what allows scuba tanks to even exist, because you're able to squeeze a lot of oxygen, enough for someone to uh, scuba dive for an extended period of time, into one tank. So compressible just means you could squeeze them into smaller areas. You can't do that with liquids and solids. They have extremely low densities. Uh, remember, density basically refers to whether something floats or sinks on top of something else. So gases are the least dense out of three states. So they'll always be above them. So that's why gases are floating above us in the air. Uh, pressure depends on number of collisions. The most important thing you want to remember about pressure it's basically the number of collision that dictates it. The more collisions you have, the greater the pressure. So anything that increases the number of collisions, for example, if you increase temperature, you're making the gas molecules move faster. So what does that do? It increases the chance of collisions. Um, when you are uh, squeezing into a smaller space, you're decreasing volume. What are you doing? You're once again creating a possibility for more collisions, which increases pressure. All right, so continuing on. Uh, this is an example of a mercury uh, sample that has a tube inserted into it. So when we talk about pressure, there's different units we usually use. We use one atmosphere. Um, one atmosphere is equal to 760 torr, which is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. These are all equivalent. And you need to know all three of these because you're going to have to convert between the three. Now, the math's really straightforward and simple. For example, if you're trying to go from two atmospheres to let's say millimeters of mercury, each do a T-chart and you know there's one atmosphere, uh, 760 millimeters as being equivalent. So remember T-charts, the way it's set up, the top and the bottom number are equivalent to each other and all the trying to do is go between one unit and the other. So in this situation, atmosphere cancels out. So we get two times that, which gives you 15, 20 millimeters of mercury. So when you're converting between units, the math's really basic. Typically, what you're going to be doing is going from millimeters of mercury to atmospheres. And we'll talk about why a little bit later. Um, the important thing to note in all that is all you have to do is just divide by 760. So in case you don't want to do the whole T-chart and you get traumatized by it, just take whatever pressure to give you in millimeters of mercury or tor, divide by 760, and your answer will be an atmosphere. Really straightforward. Now, for those wondering what the heck is 760 millimeters of mercury, it basically is telling you how high mercury will rise based on wherever you put it. So atmospheric pressure is the pressure all around us creating by air and gravity pulling it toward the center of the earth. So in this situation, at sea level, you experience exactly 760 millimeters of mercury, meaning that this mercury will rise 760 millimeters. Yes, the unit of measurement, millimeter. That's what we're referring to. And mercury, because this is mercury. So that's where that unit came from, in case you're like, what the heck is this? That's exactly the concept behind it. But remember, uh, what we're gonna always try to use is go to atmosphere. So if you get it in this or this unit, you're gonna convert over two atmospheres by dividing by 760. All right, so gas laws. Uh, we're gonna talk about Boyle's law first. It's an inverse relationship, which basically tells you as pressure goes up, volume goes down. As volume goes down, pressure goes up. So down here, you'll see Boyle's law. And what it's telling you is that as you decrease the amount of space in the container, you will actually increase the pressure. So if there's less volume, there's more pressure. And if you're wondering why, it's really straightforward. When you have less space, you have more collisions. And what do we say about more collisions? 
That's right, more pressure. So that's the reason. It's the only gas law that's inverse, meaning opposites. The other two gas law, which is temperature and volume and temperature and pressure, are directly proportional. What that means is that as the temperature goes up, the pressure goes up. As the temperature goes up, the volume goes up. They're directly related. If you double the temperature, you double the volume. If you double the pressure, you double the no, temperature. So these are all linked up. Whereas with the gas solids, if you double the pressure, you're actually having, going down by half, the volume. So that's what the inverse is referring to. Uh, Charles Law is here. And you can see in Charles Law, what's happening is that as you put this balloon over a low temperature, it contracts. So low temperature, low volume. And as you put a fire underneath it, the volume increases. So high temperature, high volume. So directly proportional. That's what it refers to. The third gas law that you need to be aware of, there is one for Gilusac, which is temperature and pressure, but the, I'll show you what it looks like. So if you look at these two formulas, you see how this is P1, V1, P2, V2. See how this is T1, V2. This implies a direct relationship, as weird as that looks, whereas this implies the inverse relationship. So because Gilusac's law, which is temperature and pressure, um, involves that, the formula will look exactly like this, except P will take the place of volume. And that's Key's Blue Sachs Law, which basically is directly proportional, but it doesn't come up too often, so that's why we don't talk about it too much. All right, ideal gas equation, used for gases where conditions are not changing. So for Charles Law, for Boyle's Law, things have to change. Either the volume has to change, the temperature has to change, or the pressure has to change. When those things change, you use one of those laws. And I'll show you a shortcut for that. So you have to memorize all those formulas. But if nothing is changing, and especially if the word mole is in the sentence or grams, which you can easily go to moles, it's an ideal gas law equation. Now for ideal gas law, the formula is PV equals NRT, which is pretty much summarized as the most important gas law because it's the most commonly used. And you're almost guaranteed to use it on the AP exam. Um, this law, just really briefly going into it, you see how there's three different R values? So the R is one of these uh, values. Now, we're going to make our life really easier. This is always the R we're going to use. We're just going to memorize one number, and that's important. Now, in order to use this just one number, your pressure always has to be in atmosphere. So this is pressure in atmospheres. So if it's not in atmospheres, go to atmospheres. Why do we do this? So we don't have to memorize all the other R variations, right? We don't want to have to know what it is for Pascal's or for Tor. We don't care. And that's the way it should be. Uh, this R is used for energy, in case you're wondering where it came from. So is this one. This is for calorie. That's for joules. Um, getting back to here, N is your moles. <laughs> v is volume, of course. Your R is 0 0.0821 always. And your T is temperature, but it has to be in Kelvin. That's the one thing you got to make sure of. And the reason for that, because Kelvin doesn't have any negative values, you can't have a negative pressure, or negative volume. So if you put temperature in Celsius or Fahrenheit, you're going to get negative numbers. And that's not what we want. So make sure your temperature is always in Kelvin for this. Make sure your volume is always in liters. Because your R requires that. If you don't put it in liters, you put it in milliliters, you're going to get a very small value and it'll be all screwed up. So be careful. So this is when things are all staying the same. So they don't tell you the volume, pressure, temperature changing. That's your formula. They give you moles or grams. That is your formula. Now, what if things are changing? All you have to do is memorize this formula. P1, V1, N2. Uh, T2 equals P2, V2, and N1, T1, N. If you're comfortable with being able to adjust variables, what this formula is easier to remember it is this. P1. V1 over T1 N1 equals P2 V2 over N, or sorry, T2. Yeah, you to erase that. Sorry, T2 N2. So you just say one equals two. That's the easiest way to remember it. So in the event that you don't want to sit there and memorize all those gas laws, you know, Bulls, all Charles, all whatever, just memorize this. And for those when you go, how am I going to use this? Really simple. So let's say the question gives you a different pressure and they ask you, what is the new volume going to be? 
So they give you an original volume. Let's say this is originally supposed to be one liter. Let's say this is two liters. And they say, you know what? The new pressure is now, that should be one atmosphere. My apologies. So let's say they, they say the new pressure is actually two atmospheres now. What's the new volume going to be? Once they ask you for something new, you know it's going to be a combined gas, gas salt question. So what we're going to do really simply, we're going to cancel out everything that they didn't talk to us about. They didn't tell us about temperature. So goodbye temperature. They didn't talk about moles. Goodbye moles. All they gave us was these three. So now if you look at this carefully, this is basically Ball's Law. So the way this formula works, you write the original combined gas salt formula, cancel out any letters that are not changing. When you're done, easy way to remember it. All right, densities of gases can be used to calculate the molar mass of a gas using, calcul using the following calculation. So uh, easy way to remember this is how do you make mud in the desert when you have no water? And the answer is you put dirt over P. I know it's not the you know, prettiest site, but at least you remember it, right? So M being molar mass, the mud, is equal to DRT, the dirt. The D is your density, by the way, in grams per liter. R is going to be 0 0.0821, as always. Temperature is going to be in Kelvin, as always. And pressure is going to be in atmospheres, as always. So when I plug this formula in, I can figure out the molar mass of a substance. Yes, the actual grams per mole of the substance. This shortcuts things a lot. And the question is, when the heck do you use this? Use this whenever they give you density. Whenever they ask for density of a gas or they give you density of a gas, this is your formula. All right, stoichiometry. Gases and stoic go hand in hand uh, really frequently, so much so that you have to pay attention to it. But they, they kind of mess with you a little bit. And what I mean by that is that they will intentionally give you the mass of something and they'll ask you for the pressure or volume of something else. And inherently what students do, they'll use Pivnert for this, but then they'll stop. They forget that they're not asking for the chemical they give you the grams for, they're asking for another chemical. Look at this question. The, the, determine the volume of the gas produced. Well, I have two gas produced, right? I have this, I have this. And you wanna get in the habit of kind of like, okay, I need volume of gas produced products. So how do I do this? Well, I could go from grams to moles of CH4, right? And then what you need to do is use stoichiometry to go from grams of CH4 to grams of CO2, and excuse me, to moles of CO2 and to moles of H2O. So you go to moles of CH4, then through stoic, you go to moles of CO2 and H2O. And then you can get your answer. What students inherently do, unfortunately, they'll sit there and they'll just get the moles of CH4 and they think they're done. That's not what they're asking for. You don't get the volume of CH4, you get the volume of the product. Anytime they give you a balanced equation with uh, a Pivnert involved, I'll guarantee you stoic is involved. So always look for it. Don't assume that the chemical they're starting with is the one they're interested in. So for this particular question, I'm gonna go to moles. So I have 2.25 moles of CH4. So using stoichiometry, and for those wondering how I got to this point, it's really simple. You go to 2.25 moles. Remember how we use stoic multiply by the coefficient we're looking for. So one mole of CO2. And I made a little shortcut. I should have done this divided by one mole of CH4 first. Let's do it in two steps. So you could see the way we usually do stoic. So this is we basically go to 2.25. And then we multiply that by what we're looking for. So one mole of CO2. So that gives you 2.25 moles of CO2. And then for the other one, same thing. We already have the 2.25, so we're not going to start back by dividing by one mole. Remember, you divide by the coefficient of the chemical you're starting with. We're not going to do that again because we already did it up here. Multiply by the coefficient we're looking for for this one. So we get five, excuse me, 4.50 moles of H2O. So that's how you do it. Simple story. Now, at this point, you have two options. You could add these together, do PivNerd once, or do PivNerd twice. Both will give you the same answer. My suggestion, just add them up and do it once because moles and pressure are proportional. Very important rule. So you can do this where you could do PivNerd just once instead of twice because it'll give you the same value either way. So volume is equal to NRT over P. Plug and chug. There's our values. I add them together. 
answer is 165 liters. You're done. All right, Dalton's law of partial pressures. Um, total pressure of a mixture of gas equals the sum of the pressures that each would exert if it were present alone. English just means that if you have multiple gas in a container, the total pressure is equal to each of those gases pressure added up. Logical, right? I mean, you'd think that. Why would each gas have a different pressure? Well, remember, using Pivner for each one and the variability, the moles of each one is going to differ, right? The temperature is going to be the same. The pressure is going to be influenced by the moles of gas. And the moles of gas are influenced by how many grams of each you have. Is it possible to have equal grams of all the gases? Of course it is. But what if you don't? So that's what Dalton said. You could add up the pressures of each gas together. So in other words, this is basically P total equals the pressure of each one added up. All right, partial pressures. So let's say we're trying to figure out a pressure of a gas. And this is a very important scenario that people always screw up with. Typically when you're collecting a gas, and it's not always, because this only works if the gas is not soluble in water, which is basically means that you're not gonna lose the gas to the water, which is screwing up your data. Because let's say this gas is soluble in water, then it may go down one milliliter, but what if you have a lot more of that gas now floating in here because it's soluble? So you use this only when the gas is not soluble in water. And how do you know that? Intermolecular forces. Water's polar. So what do you make sure your gas is not? Polar. You make sure you don't use a polar gas. That's a no-no. Because -no. like dissolves like. Polar will dissolve in polar. So this works for non-polar gases being produced. That's your best bet for when to do this. Um, so this is the way it works. You produce your gas in here. It goes through this tube and it goes in water. Now, why would you do it in water, you ask, right? Because in water, I could preset this. Let's say the original volume of this was, you know, one milliliter. This already accounts for the gas above, right? What you're basically measuring is the distance it travels. So if it originally was a one milliliter and then it went down to here, which is, let's say, five milliliters, you can say there's five milliliters of gas being produced because this gas forced more air up here, which puts the liquid down, and then it gave you a volume measurement for the gas. Because you're measuring the distance, the difference between before and after, you don't need to worry about if there was any gas up here originally because you don't care. All you're looking for is the change in volume, right? And that's the volume you're going to be using in your calculations because that's just a gas. The only problem with this is that you're not just going to get this gas that you're making here. You're also going to get H2O vapor. That's just inherently a problem with this experiment. You will get water vapor and you're probably like, well, who cares? Well, that's going to screw up your numbers because if you produce five milliliters of gas and one of it was water vapor, your calculation would be all screwed up, right? Because the volume you're going to be using is inaccurate. It's too big. So how do you fix this? Really, really simple. You remember this, the pressure of gas is equal to the pressure of the atmosphere minus the pressure of the water vapor. So you will get the pressure of the atmosphere. They'll tell you the pressure of the atmosphere is 760. Like, oh, wonderful, cool. They'll give you the pressure to water at that temperature too. It's not something you have to memorize. It's not something you have to figure out. They will give it to you. All you need to be able to do is subtract. That's it. That's all you do, subtract. People forget though. So when you forget, when you do this calculation, so I'll give you a scenario. CH4 gas is collecting your denominator, combustion vessel at 26 degrees Celsius, so they gave us a temperature. Uh, the volume of the gas inside the denominator was 78 milliliters. If the volumetric, uh, excuse me, if the atmospheric pressure is 764 torr, how many grams of CH4 are collected? So first thing you have to ask yourself, what is the formula? Is anything changing? No. So this is going to be not a combined gas law question. It's going to be an ideal gas law question. That's the way you want to frame this unit for yourself, right? Like kind of what heat calculation is only two options. For this, you have three options. You have the ideal gas law, combined gas law, and then uh, dirt over P. How do you know which one to use? Real simple. If they give you density, dirt over P. If they give you changing conditions, combined gas laws. If they don't change conditions or they have grams like they do here, it's going to be a Pivner question, at least for the AP exam. Now, technically, you could have grams and moles in the, in the combined gas cell, but they don't do that on the AP. So let's just shortcut it, shall we? So this is the important number everybody forgets. 
All you have to do in this question is the first thing, subtract 764 minus 25, get the water vapor out, the rest of your pressure is due to your gas, and you're good to go. That's all you have to do. Real simple, but people don't do it. So the first thing you want to do in this calculation, go to um, how many, what the pressure of the gas is by itself, so subtract the water vapor out. Next thing you do is go to atmospheres. How do we do that? Remember, divide by 760. So 0 0.97 atmospheres. Then your moles is basically based on Pivnard. So here's our pressure, 0.97. Now, if you put 764, which a lot of students will do, you'll get a zero, and that would suck. So don't do it. Just remember that if they give you a number, it's not there for entertainment value. It's going to be used somehow, right? Majority of the time. Either if it's a multi-step question, it could be used later, but it'll use, be used somewhere. Um, so 0 0.974 atmospheres, there's your volume. Just convert that to liters. And in case you don't know how to convert, decimal point three times to the left. That's how you go from milliliters to liters. Uh, to go to Kelvin, just add 273. That gives us our Kelvin temperature, which is 299 in this situation. And your R is constant. Just plug and chug. There's your moles. And you're done. Um, to go to grams, the last step, because they're asking for how many grams in this. And I always try to circle what I'm looking for just so I don't brain fart it. Sometimes you solve for something and then it's not even what you're looking for. Like a lot of people will stop at the point zero zero three oh nine moles and say I'm done. Yeah, but that's not what they're asking for. So grams, just multiply the moles times the molar mass, and you're done. There's your grams of CH4. All right, can I talk about your theory? This is the theory we use to try to understand gases. Now, I'll be perfectly honest with you. A lot of the rules for this are not realistic because gases don't behave this way. But in order for us to understand gases, we have to create rules for ourselves. Otherwise, we cannot study gases. So this works. This theory works at high temperatures and low pressures. At high temperatures and low pressures, for the most part, this theory will work. At low temperatures and high pressures, does not work very well. So here are the main tenets. Paraphrased, of course. Gases may be considered to be point masses, no volume, just masses. What does this mean? Gases don't take up space. Do gases take up space? Yeah, of course they do. Is it a lot? No, but they do take up space. But we're going to assume they don't. Why? Because otherwise our numbers get all screwed up. Two, gas molecules move in random motion with elastic collision. Now, what is an elastic collision? An elastic collision is two cars driving at 50 miles per hour each, colliding with each other, and then bouncing off at 50 miles per hour. They didn't lose any energy. That's what elastic collision means. You don't lose energy. So they're saying that when two gases collide with each other, they don't lose any energy. Is that reality? Of course not. Of course they lose energy. But, but at high temperatures and low pressures, more or less, you could agree. You could assume this. Gas molecules do not have any intermolecular forces. This means they don't attract each other. What's the problem with this? If two gases can never attract each other, you can never have condensation. You can never have sublimation. That makes no sense. Then we would never have a liquid ever, right? You wouldn't even have H2O. But once again, under conditions of low, excuse me, of high temperature and low pressure, we can assume this and we'll roll with it. But this is the one thing uh, you want to pay attention to, because when I ask you for questions about deviation from ideal behavior, this is probably the reason. It's going to be IMFs. So when they give you two gases and say, which one deviates most from ideal behavior? You should be like, OK, let me see the IMFs for each. Oh, this one's got stronger IMFs. So it's going to deviate the most. So whatever has the strongest intermolecular forces will deviate the most from ideal behavior. Just remember that, and I'll save you a headache. Two gases at the same temperature have the same kinetic energy. This is an important one, too, because kinetic energies only depend on temperature. So they'll mess with you. They'll give you five different gases and say, you know what? They're all the same temperature. Which one has the greatest kinetic energy? Trick question. They all have the same kinetic energy. Why? Because they're all the same temperature. The only thing that determines kinetic energy is your temperature. Remember that. Very common trick question. So the three and four are the ones that are going to test you on the most, just FYI. So here's some explanations of gases. Pressure and volume for Boyle's Law. For, so how do you use kinetic milk theory to explain it? Less space means more collisions, more pressure. If you have less space, the gas is going to collide with the surfaces more. 
more pressure. That's explaining Bohr's law using Claude Mercury theory. Pressure and temperature. Notice one of the three letters has to be constant. So between pressure, volume, and temperature, one of them has to be constant. Technically, moles us too. Otherwise, this won't be valid. Um, but for our purposes, one of those three has to be constant, right? So constant volume means increasing temperature means faster molecules and more collisions and thus more pressure. So if I had to explain Charles' law, excuse me, Gilusak's law, I would do it this way. I'd say, well, if you increase temperature, molecules are going to move faster. They have more collisions, more pressure. Anytime you're trying to explain pressure, use collisions. The frequency of collisions is part of your argument. Easiest argument you can make. Uh, volume and temperature, increasing temperature uh, means faster molecules, which means an increase in size of the container. And why is that? You're assuming the container is flexible, right? When you say constant pressure, you're saying that the container can change in size. When you're saying there's constant volume, you're saying the container is constant in size. What's the difference? An example of a constant volume would be like a you know, plastic container. What's an example of a constant pressure? Balloon. The volume can change, but the pressure is directly the same, which means that if you increase temperature, you're going to increase the volume. Uh, effusion, escape of a gas through a tiny hole into a vacuum. You can see here the gases are moving all around, and then they fuse, which is escaping to that tiny hole into a vacuum. Basically, there's no air on the other side, so it can escape into it without colliding with anything. Bigger the molecule, the solar escape. Common sense, right? Bigger molecule, harder for it to squeeze through that small hole and get out. So nothing really tricky there. Diffusion, on the other hand, is spreading of a gas going from a high concentration to low concentration. So you have food, you have it in a closed container of some sort, then you open the top. What happens? The gas diffuses. The smell emeates or permeates throughout the room. Kind of like when you cut the cheese, right? The gas is first located where you created it, and then eventually it diffuses, and everybody else gets to share in your magic. So that's an example of diffusion. So it always goes from high concentration to low concentration. What impacts the rate of diffusion? Size again. Bigger molecules move slower than the ones that are small. And this is where the whole sound of deadly comes from, if you really think about it, right? Because sound of deadly means smaller molecule because they fuse, you know, without any noise, and then it's able to move faster because it's smaller molecule, so it diffuses faster. So that's why it's small. It's, it's, it's considered uh, quiet and deadly or, uh, because the fact you can't tell it's coming and because it's moving so fast that you notice it really quickly. All right, real gases uh, behave ideally at high temperatures and low pressures. So basically, ideal conditions are perfect when you have those two things in play. So whenever there's high um, Temperature and low pressure, you can assume gases behave, real gases behave like ideal gases. Um, it's the opposite when you have a situation where it's low temperature and high pressure. All right, deviations from ideal behavior. Helium theory breaks down at high pressure and low temperature. And why is that? So just to give you a theoretical explanation on this. So low temperatures, the molecules are moving slowly, which means there's a higher probability than the molecular force each of them has will come into play. So now two molecules that originally, you know, had no interest in each other will attract each other. And that attraction means that instead of, you know, you have your surface, instead of two different molecules hitting that surface, what's going to happen instead is that this new combined molecule is going to hit it once. So the number of collisions decreases, which means your pressure will be lower than what you expect it to be. So that's what IMS really do. Because of the attraction of molecules to one another, instead of having two collisions per molecule or two molecules, you would have one collision per two molecules. And that's where IMF screws things up. And that only occurs really at, at low temperatures and high pressures. All right, types of solids. A lot of you guys are probably interested in um, this kind of structure, which is diamond. Uh, what you have here, which we call a network covalent bond. Network covalent is really cool because look at this. Surrounded by one, two, three, four, in a pyramid like structure. And it keeps on repeating itself. This is extremely, extremely stable. This is what makes diamonds have such a high melting point. In a fire, your diamonds will survive, everything else will be burnt down. 
Um, so network covalent solids are, in terms of food chain, top of the food chain as far as melting points concerned, because diamonds are really hard to melt. Are very strong, have high melting points. Examples include diamonds, silicon dioxide, and silicon carbide. So these are the ones you have to memorize. There's no way around it. Just remember it. Those are the most three most common ones that come about. If you compare diamond, these are all carbons, right? So is graphite. They're all carbons. But look at the difference. See how this carbon's attached to four other carbons? Really strong structure. Look at this one. This carbon's attached to one, two. And instead of having a, an attachment, the covalent bond to a third and a fourth one, what it has instead is intermolecular forces between the layers. That's what makes graphite so easy. You could write with it, right? Because when you're writing with a pencil, you're basically writing with graphite. And what makes diamond so hard? Molecular solids have low melting points, and except for graphite, don't get electricity. Um, Graphite's the only molecular solid that conducts electricity. So you can actually conduct electricity with pencils. True story. So if you have no other uh, electrodes available, just take two pencils, shave off both ends so the graphite's showing on both ends of it, and you have basically something to conduct electricity. You have electrodes. You can make fat of anything. And they have very low melting points. All molecular solids have low melting points. And that's an important characteristic. Ionic solids, on the other hand, conduct electricity when melted or dissolved. Please remember the melted part. Dissolved, you all know this. When you dissolve an ionic compound in water, dissociates to ions, ions can conduct electricity. Wonderful. But they can also do it when you melt them. So that's another scenario. Can you do them as a solid? No, they can't. And they have very high melting points compared to milk solids. It, here's a quick way to visualize this. If you've ever made caramel, it's basically just pure sugar, in case you didn't know. Um, it doesn't take much energy to melt the sugar. You can do it on your stovetop. Try to melt salt. You'll be there all day. You don't have enough energy produced from the methane from the stovetop to melt uh, the salt. So that's the difference. That's the easy way to visualize. Ionic compounds like salt, very high melting points. Sugar, low melting points. All right, so how to melt solids? Melting molecules uh, need to weaken IMFs. Remember, it's a physical change, so you have to basically weaken IMFs anytime you're state changing. So these are below 300 degrees Celsius. So if you want to think numerically now, molecular solids, less than 300 degrees. Now, ionic solids, 700 plus, typically. Uh, network covalent ionic solids um, can be up to 3,000 degrees Celsius. Ionic solids start around 700, 800, and they go up from there. Network covalence over 3,000. Uh, melting points of metals across a period increases since there are more delocalized electrons with stronger metallic bonds. So as you go left to right, you have delocalized electrons, a fancy of saying electrons are free to move anywhere they want in the metallic substance. So if you have a piece of iron, each atom has electrons that are free to move from the first atom of iron all the way to the end without any kind of barrier. It's really, that's what delocalized mean. They're not obligated to stay there. Um, because of that, as you go to the right, in a period, only in a period this happens, you have more delocalized electrons because you're adding more electrons to the same shell, right? Which means you have a stronger metallic bond. Why? Because the delocalized electrons now can attract, the increased number of them can attract the nucleus of another atom, and that creates what the metallic bond really is. So the more electrons you have, the better the bond. Down in group, it increases for transition metals. Um, but for everything else, um, it doesn't do that. And that's because the bigger the element is, the less attraction. So for transition metals, you can basically say, okay, as you go down a group, you have more delocalized electrons, it's gonna be a higher melting point, wonderful. But um, all other metals, that means, you know, alkaline metals, alkaline earth metals, group 4A, as you go down, uh, since you have a bigger element, you have less attraction. So now Coulomb's law comes into play, which is really weird. So why doesn't it work for transition metals, but it works for everything else? Why does Coulomb's law apply to group 1A, 2A, 3A, and 4A, but it does not apply to transition metals? It's just one of those little quirks. So it's a generality, it's a mental shortcut, if you will. So for transition metals, you could pretty much say, okay, as you go down, it's going to be higher melting point. But for everything else, it's opposite. As you go down, lower melting point, not higher melting point. And that's because Coulombic attraction decreases. And less Coulombic attraction means lower lattice energy, which means easier to melt. That's a hard one to loop around. All right, a couple of different examples of how molecules arrange themselves. Here's what's called a crystalline arrangement, 
which basically means that they're you know nicely organized and sequenced. Amorphous, something like glass, um, not you know well organized and so over the place. There's no single arrangement. Uh, those are two different states. Just to throw in so you know. All right, conducting ability of metals. Why are metals good conductors of heat? Here's why. They have fewer electrons. Not only do those electrons allow it to conduct electricity very well, they also allow it to conduct heat very well. And here's why. This electron from this element not only gets transferred via contact with other elements to conduction, right? If you're close in contact with another atom, conduction allows the heat to transfer. But it also transfers as a result of this electron from this atom will go all the way over here and it'll transfer energy with it. That's why it's a conductor of heat. So those, those low delocalized electrons are the key, not only for conducting electricity very well, but also heat very well. And you can see here, a better example of that, these delocalized electrons are able to move all around, transfer energy with them, and you're able to transfer heat extremely well with metals. All right, alloys, combination of two or more metals. Uh, there's two types of alloys you need to know, substitutional, made from almost the similar sizes. So what I mean by similar sizes? This, this, similar sizes. This, this, similar sizes. What's this similar sizes? Let's say carbon with iron. See, it's like a two to one ratio. That's what's called um, interstitial alloy. Substitutional, similar size. So the quickest way to do this mentally, um, if they're close to each other in the same period, they're probably going to be substitutional. 99% of the times can be substitutional. There's very rare exceptions for that. If there are two different periods, then it's a kind of a crapshoot. If they're close, like uh, aluminum and gallium, probably still substitutional. But if there are two more periods beyond each other, like boron and this, now it's not substitution anymore. It's going to be interstitial. So shortcut for this, if the elements are close to each other in the same period, even if they're, like look at this, scandium and copper, it's 40, it's not small, but you know, you could do then substitutional with that. You cannot do it with scandium and let's say period two. So once again, um, if they're in the same period or maybe one period apart, probably substitutional. If they're two more periods apart, definitely interstitial shortcuts. Um, and one thing I forgot to mention about this, the reason you do substitutional at all, it's better at resisting uh, collision, corrosion and that makes it more effective, like chrome, for example. Um, these materials are made out of multiple metals that prevent it from rusting as easily. Stainless steel as well. Interstitial, on the other hand, subbing a small item for a bigger one. Why do you do that? It makes it harder. So here, once again, here's an example of substitution. You can see the atom substitution are similar, right? The difference between these two are not that large. Um, Brass an example of that. Um, interstitial, on the other hand, look at the difference. Look how small this is compared to this. Huge difference. Why do you do it? Makes it harder. Steel is harder than iron. What is steel made out of? Steel is made out of um, iron and carbon. Carbon is in a different period, right? Two periods apart. So interstitial. What it does, it basically fits into the gaps between the iron molecules and it prevents it from sliding past each other easily. And that's what makes them harder. So just remember, interstitial used for making things harder. Substitutional is used for basic resistance to corrosion. Um, the other thing you can do with metals is improve them in terms of their ability to conduct by what's called doping. And there's two different types of doping. Um, there's N-type uh, doping and there's P-type doping. And we'll talk about each one. So here is an example of N-type which you're basically doing substituting an element from group five uh, to silicon. Silicon is group 4A. So when you use 5A for it, you have um, what's called N-doped silicon. Whereas if you have a P-doped one, the difference is that it's still 4A silicon, right? But now you're doing 3A. So I guess you, you could say the right side would be N, the left side would be P kind of the opposite of the alphabet, which makes it kind of confusing. But those are the two types of doping that you would need to know. So let's talk about them. So what's a donor doping? Subbing an element from group 5A, which has more valence electrons in order to improve conduction. The more valence electrons you have, the better it can conduct electricity. So that's why we do um, doping of this sort is because we want it to conduct electricity better because semiconductors have to do that. 
These are basically semiconductors. Well, so this is semiconductors. You are trying to basically have more electrons or more opportunity for electrons to move freely throughout it, and that's where the nature of these dopants come from. So for the donor dopant, in addition to the fact that um, it has extra electrons, it's called an n-type. So the ones that donate an extra valence electron are called the n-type. And the acceptor ones are the ones that actually create a hole. So what it does is subs an element from 3A that has fewer valence electrons, which basically means you create a hole in there. And that hole also allows for the free movement of electrons. So whether you're using n-type or uh, this type of acceptor dopant, in both situations, you're allowing the electrons to move more freely throughout the substance, and that's what the advantage of it is. This is called a p-type, in case you're wondering. So both of them, n-type, p-type, what you really need to know, n-type is going to be the one that has uh, group 5A, and p-type is the one that involves group uh, 3A. That's pretty much the gist of what you want to know. Um, in case you're wondering, for the example, you can see that what's happening here, antimony and silicon, the donor impurity contributes free electrons. So in this case, you're doing something from 5A, and if you're doing something from 3A, you create a hole, and in both situations, you're allowing electrons to move more freely. So donor versus acceptor, only difference is that the conduction is carried out by holes and acceptor dopants and by extra electrons and donor dopants. They both function pretty well, so it's not like there's one advantage over the other. Both lead to improved conductive ability, and that's the reason why we care about it. All right, so let's talk about solutions. So solution, the first thing you want to know is what's called solvation. Solvation is when you have water molecules surround anything you're trying to dissolve and cause them to break apart. Now, that could be ionic compounds where two ions are broken apart. Or it could be a molecular compound with the, like sugar, where the whole molecule of sugar is broken apart and taken apart. Here it's an ionic compound. You can see there's green and purple balls, two different sizes. That's indicative of an ionic compound. And you can see what's happening is that the negative end of uh, water, the negative dipole, which is the oxygen end, is going to attract the positive ions, which are the smaller ones, the purple ones. See, that, see how the red surrounds the purple? And then the positive end of water, which is your hydrogen end of it, uh, is going to attract the negative ion, which in this case is here. And you can tell that because it's bigger. The bigger ion is always going to be the anion. So ionic compounds dissolving uh, occurs when attraction of ions to water is strong and attraction of ions to each other. So if the ion likes itself enough, it will not break apart. That's what we call insoluble substances. They'll just say, you know what, forget you water. I like my partner already. But if they are soluble, then it means that they like the water more like each other. Salt likes the water more like they like each other. So you have a break apart. Please pay attention to the way they're arranging themselves. You see how the negative dipole of oxygen is attracting the cation and how the positive dipole of hydrogen is attracting the negative ion. All right, energy changes in solution. There are three steps for dissolving. Separate the molecules, uh, solid particles, that's endothermic. Anytime you separate something, you're breaking it apart, it's always going to be endothermic. So you got to put in, input of energy. Um, separation of solvent particles. So that not only do you break apart the two things that you're trying to dissolve, you also need to break apart water from each other, right? I'm using water as an example. It's any substance you're trying to dissolve inside of. Um, those molecules like each other a lot. But in order to have dissolving, you have to break those attraction between them. So one water molecule has to free itself from another water molecule, so now it could attract something new. That takes energy as well. So, so far you have two inputs of energy, both endothermic. And now the new interaction, which is typically going to be ion dipole with an ionic compound, and that's going to be exothermic. Anytime you form something, it's exothermic. Remember that anytime you break something, it's endo. So in this situation, if the energy you get out is more than energy put in, it's an exothermic reaction as a whole. But each of these steps are always gonna be endo, endo, exo. So what if the reaction as a whole gives you a positive enthalpy? What does that tell you? That means you put more in than you got out. That's what it is in a nutshell. But remember, there are three different phases of dissolving. Break apart the ions from each other, break apart the water from each other, and then form the ion with the water. And remember, the ion dipoles are very strong interaction. All right, things that affect solubility, like dissolves like, that's the big theme. Things that have similar IMS will dissolve in each other. That's the long and short of it. So things that have similar IMS will dissolve very well in each other. You can see from the diagram on uh, C6H14, um, very little of methanol dissolves because this is nonpolar. This is polar. They're not alike. 
Um, as you go down, solubility goes to infinity, whereas for alcohol and water, you can see very specific amounts that you could dissolve, how many grams per um, milliliter in a situation, excuse me, 100 gram sample of the solvent. So in general, the more similar they are, the more likely they can dissolve in each other. Uh, glucose, which is hydrogen bonding, is very soluble in water. You can see from glucose, you have all these hydrogen bonds available. And water, we know, has a lot of hydrogen bonds. That's the other thing. You want the strong force in the thing you're dissolving to be similar to the strong force in the thing you're dissolving in. So, for example, dissolving hydrogen bonds, something with hydrogen bonds, dissolves much better than if you dissolve something that's just polar inside of water. That's an important detail. You want the two strongest forces even to be identical to make it easier and more soluble. In the case of cyclohexane, you can see these are all LDFs. There's nothing going on here. So it's not going to dissolve very well in water, if at all. And for those of you, wait, wait, is an LDF on both my LDFs? Should they dissolve in each other? Yeah, but you got to remember, what's the strongest force in water? Hydrogen bonds. What's the strongest force in cyclohexane? LDF. Is the water going to really want to break its really strong hydrogen bonds in order to attract a weak LDF? No, it's not. And that's the reason they're not soluble in each other. Very slightly soluble. Can't say complete zero. For gases, just remember, the lower the temperature, the more the gas. That's the long and short of it. Um, the size of the molecule also plays a role. You can see the solubility increases as the mass increases. So if you're trying to compare two nonpolar substances and saying, okay, which one's going to dissolve better? There's some polar here too. Um, the larger it is, the more likely it's going to dissolve in water. For gases anyway. This is not for everything, it's just for gases. So please don't extrapolate too much. The other thing is going to be temperature. Low temperatures means more gases. So this is why you put your soda in the freezer instead of in the oven, because cold soda gives you more carbonation than warm soda does. All right, temperature and gases. You can see what's going on for solubility. CH4, as you increase the temperature, temperature's on this scale, right? So as you increase the temperature, you can see how you get less and less methane in there. Um, you can see the same thing for oxygen. So increased temperature means less gas dissolved in liquid. Concentration, uh, this is where the mass component comes in. You already know how the molarity, it's just moles per liter of solution. Uh, real simple formula, we've done this a lot. Here's an example of it. So to give you 25 grams of magnesium chloride, 40 milliliters of solution. So all you have to do is just divide the moles of the solute divided by the liters of solution. So you get your moles of magnesium chloride divided by the volume, and you get your molarity, which is 0 0.0584 molar. For molality, it's moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. So that's molality. Here's a scenario. Solution is prepared by dissolving 25 grams of magnesium chloride in 0 0.050 kilograms. So they already give you the mass in kilograms. You just have to change the magnesium chloride to moles divided by that kilograms, and you're done. So unlike molarity, which is volume of solution, which is going to be your solute and solvent combined, this is only the solvent. That's the big difference. So 5.26 mol. For those wondering why I got my using molality, when you're calculating freezing point and blowing point of substances, you need to use molality, unfortunately. Sorry, it's the bad news. All right, colligative properties. Um, in a nutshell, all it is is that the more particles you have, the higher the boiling point and the lower the freezing point. Particles meaning things that have or dissociation or undergo dissociation. So NaCl versus Na3PO4. NaCl, as you know, is soluble. It produces one Na and one Cl minus ion solution. So that's two particles. Na3PO4 is also soluble. It produces three plus one. So which one of these is going to have a higher boiling point, a lower freezing point, and a lower vapor pressure? Why? More particles. So if the molality is identical for both of them, the one that has the most particles will have not only the highest boiling point, but also the lowest freezing point and the lowest vapor pressure. All right, vapor pressure is just basically the gas directly above a liquid produced by the liquid. So any liquid you have is going to have some of its content converted into a gaseous phase. And that pressure created by that liquid gas is called the vapor pressure. So vapor pressure is basically produced by a liquid on its own. 
adding solute means you need to break additional IMFs between solid particles. So originally, let's say this is just water. So in order to boil this or evaporate this, you just have to break the IMS between the water molecules, right? What if I add NaCl? Well, now the Na plus forms an ion dipole with water. The Cl minus forms an ion dipole with water. That's very strong. So guess what? You need more energy now in order to break that and cause boiling to occur. So what does it do to your vapor pressure? It makes it lower. Remember the big crazy loop. The stronger the IMFs, the lower the vapor pressure, higher the boiling point. All right, boiling point elevation. This is the first calculation that involves molality. Kb is a constant. This is going to be uh, for water. The most common we're going to use is going to be 0.51. M is molality, so moles per kilogram. S is number of particles. So NaCl, two particles. Na3PO4, four particles. So X is the number of particles. Example, NaCl would have X equals two. Well, for molecular compounds, it will be one. That's, that's the other thing I forgot to mention, and it's very important. Anything that is not ionic will have exactly one particle. So if you have this, one particle. If you have this, one particle. Anything that involves a molecular compound, how can you tell it's a molecular compound? No metal in the formula. So it means both things are from the right side of the periodic table. So whenever you have that one particle, you do not sit there and count your subscripts and think that's many particles. That's ludicrous. Don't do that. So for those, it's just one. Important add answer from equation and add to solvents boiling point. So for water, once you do this calculation, you add it to the original boiling point of water, which is 100. I'm sure you had to do that in a second. And that's your actual boiling point. This only measures the change in temperature. It's not your final boiling point. All right, freezing point, similar. Tf is equal to negative xkfm. Um, X is still number of particles. Kf in this situation is going to be 1.86, the constant. You don't have to memorize it. And M is still molality. So once again, um, you're going to subtract this from the original freezing point. So let's do an example of this to understand it. So the freezing point and boiling points of naphthalene and um, you have naphthalene and nicotine. So first thing, here's your grams. Um, you have to identify the solute and solvent on your own. This is one single solution. So one of these is the solute, one is the solvent. How can you tell? Whatever you have more of is your solvents. Your solvent in this situation is naphthalene. So this is solvent. Your solute is nicotine. So when I'm doing molality, it's going to be moles of nicotine per kilogram of naphthalene. That's where the math comes in. Here's our original freezing point. Here's our original boiling point. So I'm going to add and subtract to those numbers. So let's get started. So first molality, all I did was go from grams of nicotine to moles by dividing by the molar mass of nicotine. So I just add up all the mass together, and then that gives you molar mass, and that's what you use your mold. Divided by your kilogram of solvent, how do you do kilograms? So you take 50 grams, decimal point three times to the left, kind of like going from uh, milliliters to liters, same concept, one, two, three. 0 0.050 kilograms. You can also divide by 1,000 if you want to go that way. Either way, the molality is 1.23. Now, this is a molecular compound. How do I know this? I don't see any metal. That's why. Really straightforward, guys. And if it gives you a common name you're not familiar with, it's probably going to be a molecular compound as well. So now that we have a molality, I'm going to plug it into my formula. So for TF, there's 1.323. Your X was 1. How? Because it's a molecular compound. Your uh, constant they give you, molality you figured out, same thing with this. Your x is here is 1, 2, in case you're wondering. Um, then multiply together, so here's your change in temperature for freezing point. Here's your change in temperature for boiling point. So now I'm going to add and subtract these to the originals. So for freezing point, it's 80.29 minus 8.54. There's your temperature, 71.75. And for the other one, add. Um, which in this situation will be 217.96 plus 7.63. All right, and I want to go over hydrogen bonding because it's something that's always tested in the AP exam, and for whatever reason, people always screw up. So where can you have hydrogen bonding in this? So the first thing I want you to recognize, is very important, hydrogen bonding means that the central atom has to be either nitrogen, oxygen, or hydrogen. So in this situation, 
here are the places I could do hydrogen bonding. I could do it off of here, off of here, and well, technically here, but they have backbone. I don't know what to confuse it. You cannot do it off the carbons at all. They can't do hydrogen bonding. So if you're going to try to show hydrogen bonding, please don't try to show it anywhere else because that's going to be a problem. So for this one, if I'm doing hydrogen bonding, I'm showing it. This is how you do it. You go H O H. Here's your lone pairs. And here, we assume there's two lone pairs. What hydrogen bonding is, is nothing more than a connection between a lone pair and a hydrogen. This doesn't have hydrogen, so I can't really do hydrogen bonding coming from this. It's going to be through here. So watch what I do. Let's put some dashed lines between the hydrogen and the lone pair. That's hydrogen bonding right there. I could do it again. If I put another water molecule, here's my H's. Here's my lone pairs. Once again, showing hydrogen bonding like that. Both of these have O, F, or N as a central atom, so hydrogen bondings are good. You cannot do it for this one. Just because there's an H here doesn't mean there's hydrogen bonding. Why? The central atom is not F, F, excuse me, F, N, or N. F, fun, F, O, and N. Uh, for this one, same thing. I could do it. So I'm going to show you how to do this one too. Lone pair. So here, look how the hydrogen bonding goes. You could also technically do it with the hydrogen of this and the nitrogen, but the nitrogen doesn't have a lone pair. It does actually. So there's one, two, three attachments. You expect a lone pair. So you could do it there too if you wanted to. We'll do one more for this O. Same thing, right? You could just do H, O, H, lone pair, lone pair. There's hydrogen bond. You only have to do one of these, but please remember how hydrogen bonding works. Both of them have to have F. O or N is a central atom, otherwise it is not going to work. So that was take some matter and solutions in a nutshell. And by the way, the reason you do doping at all is to create semiconductors. So for 5A, you're adding electrons. Okay, one. Wonderful. This is called N-type because it's going to give you extra electrons. It's the name given to it.